Welcome to Garden City Church, a place where you can belong before you believe. This week, George gives us an excellent message just talking about how to heal your soul and a concept called moral injury. Um, something that I think we've all been through and have felt but don't know how to describe. If you'd like to partner with us, there's three ways you can do that. You can like and subscribe, you can share this video, or you can partner with us financially. You can do that online or you can send us a check. We love you guys so much. Let's get into the Word with George. Hey everyone, welcome to Garden City. I want to start off with a, a few pictures of life uh, through the pandemic. Imagine with me, if you would, teachers who have dedicated their whole life to helping uh, kids grow. They, they care about connecting with them so they can develop and learn. Um, and then through the pandemic, teachers having to move from the classroom and then, you know, having to learn how to teach through computer screens and then later through masks and doing all these things that are so different from what they were actually trained to do, having to use methods that like were, are difficult. Many of the teachers beginning to feel uh, feelings of disconnection and frustration over maybe a lack of support just in their world. And um, these frustrations beginning to bubble up and they try to put on a good face and do their best. But at the end of the day, and at the end, end of their weeks, they feel exhausted, burn out, um, and even having feelings of failure at their job. Imagine again with me, maybe medical workers, nurses, doctors, processing numbness and anger at being unable to help everyone come into who's coming into the hospital the over inundation and big swells of of people and need imagine having to put a person into a body bag one week and then another person from the same family the next week because of the pandemic emotionally breaking down when you have to Separate yourself from your children because you need to be quarantined for their safety and other people's safety. Just the feelings and emotions that swell up because of the, the tough circumstances. Imagine one more time with me, a new business owner that just opened up their shop. They've spent their, their life savings on getting this, uh, this dream launched and financed. And when the COVID reality hits with all its restrictions, it slowly begins killing the dream, the culture, the heart of the owner and the workers. Now the owner and the staff and their families aren't sure if the business is going to make it through the year. What has this time that we've gone through in the last three years, what have these pressures, what have these stresses done to our souls? How's your soul? Many of us probably can relate to feeling uh, stretched or just pieces of our lives being pulled apart, uh, a sense of like, like a loss of wholeness. Some might call this feeling like our lives are divided. We live in a world where there's so many lines that, are, that divide people. Like there's lines between people, uh, there's lines that get drawn through people. And in our lives, in our hearts, we often can have a sense of division, a line that's drawn from our inner life to our outer lives from our inner world to our outer world. Somewhere along the line, uh, a wall can be built. A line can be drawn between our souls and our roles in life. When we go through great times of pressure and stress, I mean, cultural, cataclysmic stuff, like very difficult things, um, that division gets worse, or maybe it started and the cracks start to, to develop. This is the division between our being and our doing. Looking at this image, it's, it's a visual representation of uh, maybe the division between our being and our doing, uh, or our identity and our impact, our souls and our roles in life. And I, I think we're created to have our, our being and our doing integrated, our souls and our roles integrated and whole. But so often, uh, because of the pressures of life and maybe just our, our growing up, things that have happened to us growing up, there's this this division, this fracture has happened between those things. Now, every one of us is a soul of unimaginable value, gifts, and purpose. When we live disconnected from our being and our doing, we're disconnected from the most important roles that we have in life, the roles of father, mother, neighbor, profession, you know, our profession, or maybe just being a friend. And Jesus 
spoke to this aspect of who we are, this inner life and outer life, our being and our doing. He said, a good tree doesn't produce bad fruit, nor does a bad tree produce good fruit. Each tree is known by its own fruit. People don't gather figs from thorny plants, nor do they pick grapes from prickly bushes. Hone in on verse 45. A good person produces good from the good treasury of the inner self, while an evil evil person produces evil from the evil treasury of the inner self. The inner self overflows with words that are spoken. And we know from the book of Matthew on a similar passage, that's not only the, the inner self overflowing with words that are spoken, but also works that are done. Notice that Jesus in this teaching emphasizes that we are, as spiritual beings, we have both this inner and outer world. We are made up of the invisible and the visible, our being and our doing. And there's, there's a connection there. The inner self, if you remember, the inner self, you and I both have an inner self, a, a soul, like a unique, invisible element of who you are. The inner self overflows to the world. Now, the question is, does the outer world flow in? Parker Palmer helps us see the reciprocal relationship between our inner world and our outer world. He says this, whatever is inside us continually flows outward to help form or deform the world. That's basically the verse we just read, the teaching of Jesus. And he adds, and whatever is outside us continually flows inward to help form or deform our lives. So there's like this reciprocity. There's this inflow and outflow to our lives. The outer world, it, it impacts us since we were little. The experiences we have, the people we're around, the relationships we have, the ideas that we hear and learn. And then we have an impact on our world. There's, a, there's an outward flow. Most of us deeply desire to bring our soul to the world. Like we, there's something in us that wants to be known, that wants to be heard, that we want to leave our, our imprint on the world around us and a, and a good imprint. But somewhere along the line, usually when we're young or maybe through a very stressful time, we can begin to hide and conform. Many people live lives that are of quiet desperation, trapped in the interior walls that we or maybe others have helped build, fearful, tired, anxious, exhausted, carrying shame and maybe guilt, never bringing our whole self, our whole soul to the, to the roles we've been given in our life as fathers, mothers, professionals, neighbors, and friends. Many people hide behind the walls that they've created between their inner world and their outer world. This outside world that we, we show to everybody might look fine. It might look the way everybody says we should look. But internally, there's a price to pay. What gain is it to gain the whole world but for, forfeit your soul? And again, add times of great turmoil, like a pandemic, and pressure that we go through in times like that, our souls experience tremendous bruising and battering. The question is, what does this do to us? What does it feel like to have our inner world kind of ripped away from our outer world, to have a disconnect? And what happens to us when we live a life when we never bring our true and whole self to the roles of our life? Whenever there's a rending between our inner world and our outer world, there's a disconnect. It's like a a bruising of the soul occurs. And like a limb that's bruised, it often takes time for the bruise to reveal itself, for the for the blood to rise to the surface and be seen. I don't know if you've ever had a bruise in your arm or your leg, but it takes a little while. You can feel the pain before it's ever seen, and and maybe people can't see it, but the bruise, the contusion is there, and the blood will rise to the surface, and that's when you see it. Before you see the bruise, the damage is still there from the trauma. And when our soul is bruised, I think it can be really similar that some of the hurt and some of the pain um, can take a while to fully be articulated, to fully be known, but we're still hurting. As I've spent time meeting uh, and listening to people in our church and different groups um, from different professions, teachers, um, administrators, medical field workers, people from the helping professions, there has been a, a hurt and pain echoed over and over, uh, an injury of soul 
feelings of disconnect. I ran across a clinical term used to describe this. I actually ran into it from multiple people in helping professions. And here's what it's called. This is called the concept of moral injury. A specific kind of trauma results when a person's core principles and inner convictions, aspects of a person that can't be seen but are are of utmost importance, like they're about our purpose in life. So when a person's core principles and inner convictions are violated during especially tough times like wartime or pandemic, something called moral injury can occur. Now, to help us understand this concept and to, to like shed some biblical light on this, I first want to read some portions of an article on moral injury by Elizabeth Svoboda. She wrote in her article, Moral injury is a specific trauma that arises when people face situations that deeply violate their conscience or threaten their core values. Those who grapple with it can struggle with guilt, anger, and a consuming sense that they can't forgive themselves or others. She also writes, when COVID swept the planet, the moral injury crisis became more pressing as ethically wrenching dilemmas became the new normal, not just for healthcare workers, but for others in frontline roles. Store employees had to risk their own safety and that of of vulnerable family members to make a living. Lawyers often could not meet with clients in person, making it nearly impossible to represent those clients adequately. In such situations, no matter how hard you work, you're always going to be falling short, said one public defender in the article. Svoboda went on to write, moral injury tends to turn up When you have a vision of the world as fundamentally fair and good, and something you've done or witnesses actually destroys that vision. Now, the moral injury that leaders often see in healthcare doesn't stem from one-time cataclysmic events. Many providers are suffering uh, what's called death by a thousand cuts. I'm not a clinician or a psychologist. I'm a pastor. But this language of moral injury is language of the soul. What clinicians may call moral injury, I would call an injury to the soul and conscience. And into our pain and our broken souls, I believe, enters Jesus. He shows us a way to live in the world with wholeness between our being and our doing, with our souls and our roles connected And he helps us find healing when those things are broken. Jesus said this, Come to me, all of you who are tired and have heavy loads, and I will give you rest. Accept my teachings and learn from me. It's often said, take on my yoke. I love this version because it it gets to the meaning. Accept my teachings is, is really what taking on a yoke of somebody. It's like taking on the teachings of a rabbi. And Jesus is saying, take on my teachings, learn from me in contrast to the other religion and other philosophy of his day and our day. And Jesus goes on to say, because I'm gentle and humble in spirit. Take on my teachings because I am gentle and humble in spirit. Don't we need more leaders in our lives like that? Don't we need more voices? And Don't we think voices that are humble and gentle will bring more healing? And I think so. Uh, The verse continues, and you will find rest for your souls. Jesus is saying, take on my teaching, take on my way, because I'm gentle, I'm humble, and you will find rest for your souls. The burden that I ask you to accept is easy. The load I give you to carry is light. I love that passage. And Jesus is really saying, like, my teaching, my way is, is going to bring integrity. It's going to bring wholeness to your being and your doing, your inner world and your outer world. Now, I want to finish with this last uh, passage. It says this, a large crowd followed him and he healed all who were sick. Jesus is the heart of the healer. In verse 16, but he warned them not to tell other people about him. This was to make what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah come true. And it says this, pay attention here. Here is my servant. I have chosen him. He is the one I love. I am very pleased with him. I will put my spirit on him. He will announce to the nations that everything will be made right. 
He will not argue or cry out. Like, Jesus was not loud, not braggadocious. Passage goes on and says, no one will hear his voice in the streets. Jesus doesn't impose his will on others. Verse 20, he will not break a bent twig. Another translation, he will not uh, break a bruised reed. He will not put out a dimly burning flame. Jesus is gentle and humble with the broken. He will make right win over wrong. And the nations will put their hope in him. As we read through these passage, I, passages, I think that one really key theme for those of us who are struggling with a broken and hurting soul, Jesus is gentle. He's a kind teacher. He is a healer. He's the Lord of Sabbath rest. And he's gentle with the bruised and the burnt out. If you're feeling bruised, your soul is bruised, you're feeling burnt out, you're feeling exhausted, anxious, angry, and like this is new feelings about your world and about your life right now, you might be at an all-time low. Jesus is gentle with you and me, any of us who are bruised and burnt out. You know, I think people are feeling so broken right now, and I think people are longing for a greater sense of wholeness and integration between their souls and their roles in life. Like they might feel like they can't bring their whole self. Like they just can't. They're feeling empty. I can't be the mom that I want to be. I can't be the dad I want to be. I can't be the teacher, uh, the nurse, the businessman, the, you know, whatever you name. I can't be the friend I want to be, the neighbor I want to be. And Jesus wants you to be whole. He wants you to take on his way of seeing the world, his teaching, the way of the kingdom. He wants you to have a healthy, connected soul, healthy being, healthy doing. He wants to heal those areas of the injuries and the wounds of soul, the the moral injury. And I think that healing, I think that wholeness um, finds its greatest expression in us and gets started in us when we begin to trust the gentle and humble voice of Jesus. He's the healer. He's the teacher. He knows how we're made. He knows what we're made for. The rest, healing, and and growing in wholeness can be sustained and directed by Jesus, and I think in a Jesus community, a community made up of individuals, unique individuals, not all the same, processing and doing soul work together in a grace-filled community of belonging. I think if we can create these spaces of grace, we we can begin talking openly without, you know, being afraid, without, you know, having people play the doctor and fix our lives, without people correcting us. We can be we can create a, an environment where everyone in the room can start talking about questions of purpose, calling, gifting, hurting, healing, grieving, and glorifying. Guys, I love you so much, and I just want to invite you back next week. We're going to be exploring more deeply some practical teachings of Jesus that unite us and unite unite us from within, our being and our doing, our souls and our roles. I love you so much. I'll see you next week.
Second birth. 